Um, and thank you, Mr. Lash, Mr. Gregor, and Captain Hans. I know there's been a lot of uh, focus uh, from uh, city staff on this issue, and I really appreciate it. I know Councilman Fusco and I had a chance to speak with Deputy Mayor Brown, who shared a lot of information about, about the work that's ongoing as well. I have a couple of questions. Um, the first is, what are the actual violations or legal requirements from the housing code or from the state fire code as to having an operational elevator, right? Is it, you know, I guess that's, a, that's the first question. Mr. Greg, would you like to? I can tackle my my end of, my end of that. So, in buildings that have more than one means of egress, such as this, uh, these buildings do also have stairways. Uh, notwithstanding the special needs of the, of the occupants, um, elevators in general are covered by the state uh, division of industrial compliance, uh, and and normally their licensing and inspections are done through that state office. Um, it's my understanding that that, that state uh, office might have recently sent inspectors uh, to look at the, op at, the uh, at the elevators there while they were operating. At least that's what the uh, property manager told me. Where we can make a case that this is covered under the housing code would be that the elevators could be considered a supplied piece of equipment and because the elevators are supplied with the building, uh, they can be required to be kept in good repair. Um, of, of course, uh, given that there's, there are alternate means of egress in the building, uh, if, if we had an owner that felt that, uh, that repairing elevators uh, in, in a building of that type would, would be beyond their, uh, their means or their desires, uh, they would always have the option to remove them. Uh, or to uh, discontinue them from use, uh, which is obviously something that we would not want to see happen in a building uh, with this population. But uh, that's the connection that we make with the housing code, with the housing code authority, uh, as, as it pertains to uh, the elevators as a supply piece of equipment. Okay, so there isn't a specific requirement that, you know, an elevator be operable, you know, under the code. If it's not operable, that's a, you know, that's the specific violation. No, there's nothing in the housing code that states that specifically other than that the premises is required to have a safe, unobstructed means of egress. Okay, thank you. And then Captain Haas, is there uh, any requirements in the state fire code about elevators? So for our requirement, we just have the two-way communication so that when people are on the elevator, they get stuck and, and they need to call. Uh, otherwise, the state, you know, runs all the, you know, the mandates for the elevators. We just ensure that there's two-way communication. And then, of course, when there's a problem like this, we do everything we can to make sure that you know, the, the citizens have what they need, medications and such. Thank you, sir. Um, and, and Mr. Gregor, to that point, it sounds like there was a referral made to the state, the relevant state board. It's, it's the Industrial Commission or it's the Department of Commerce or what, what department is it? Uh, it might be part of the Department of Commerce. I believe it's the Division of Industrial Compliance. And my understanding was that they were notified and they did respond. Okay. Um, and then uh, one more question. Um, you, you mentioned, Mr. Greger, that we've attempted to make um, a connection with the uh, property owner. Uh, what's that outreach been? And, and it sounds like it has not been successful. Well, this property is, uh, yeah, Councilman. This, this this property is owned by a by by an LLC, an out of state uh, corporation, Apex White Pond LLC, uh, that I believe is incorporated in New Jersey. Uh, the, the the main information I have regarding them is from their rental registration, where they name their local their local agents. I do have uh, uh, contact information for the regional property manager. Uh, who manages the building, but uh, as far as the actual ownership, uh, I, I received some information uh, of a possible name of a person or persons in New Jersey. Uh, I reached out to them last week via email. I was unsuccessful in an attempt to get a human being on the phone. They have a very uh, 
uh, well-guarded voice prompt system at their company uh, uh, phone system. Uh, my email went, went uh, unresponded to, and uh, I forwarded that email to the name and contact information I have for uh, the regional property manager, uh, and uh, that was this morning, and I have not heard from him either. Okay. Thank you, sir. And I guess, you know, that that just prompts to my uh, mind the idea that, you know, we, have, we are, this is not the first time we've talked about out-of-state property owners that are difficult to get a hold of. And when Captain Haas says that, you know, the, what's being done right now is essentially a band-aid and that there had to be some pressure applied to encourage them to make an investment on a more permanent part, that that, that, that was difficult. Um, and the unresponsiveness, that's that's all very frustrating because these, these property owners have a, a legal responsibility, but they also have a moral responsibility. Um, so I, I'd like to us all to think about what we can do as a council to uh, invite the, the property owners to come speak with us uh, here in a public setting um, or, or otherwise. Uh, but I really appreciate your efforts, Mr. Gardner. I know I know you've been doing a lot in terms of trying to get through this labyrinth uh, that they've set up. Uh, but I definitely hope that we can make that connection and uh, get, get some answers. But thank you, everyone, for, for the information. I really appreciate it.